This is Gestoras. Gestoras Podcasts brings you conversations with cultural managers from the North and the South. We celebrate the work of Latina cultural managers, sharing their stories of success, challenges, and lessons learned. The episodes alternate between Spanish and English each week. El episodio de hoy de Gestoras es en inglés. Pueden leer la transcripción en español en nuestro sitio web o pueden ver el episodio en YouTube con subtítulos en español. Magdalena Moreno Mujica became executive director of IFACA in August 2017, having first joined the organization as deputy director in 2014. Currently, she is a member of UNESCO's Expert Facility Group 2019-2022, to support the implementation of the 2005 Convention. She is the author of the chapter, Building Resilient and Sustainable Cultural and Creative Sectors in the 2022 UNESCO Global Report, Reshaping Policies for Creativity, Addressing Culture as a Global Public Good. Prior to this, Ms. Moreno Mujica was Head of International Affairs at the National Council for Culture and the Arts, Chile, an international ministerial advisor. In this role, she oversaw international arts and cultural strategy, served as program director of the Sixth World Summit on Arts and Culture in Santiago 2014, delivered Chile's participation in three Venice Biennales, served on the board of the Fundación Imagen de Chile, and represented Chile on the IFACA board from 2012 to 2014. Before this, Ms. Moreno Mujica was based in Australia, where she was CEO of Culture, the national peak body supporting cultural diversity in the arts from 2008 to 2011, a member of the National Cultural Policy Task Force for Creative Australia, and led an international initiative to strengthen South-South Dialogue, the South Project, from 2004 to 2008. She holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Melbourne, is an alumna of the Asia Link Leaders Program 2008, and the Australia Council for the Arts Emerging Leaders Program 2010. She has served on several boards, including for Diversity Arts Australia. All right, Magdalena Moreno Mujica, welcome. Thank you for being here in Quistoras. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. I'm on the other side of the world, so I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm in what is Melbourne today, but is Boiwuroi land and um, of the East Kulin Nation. Pleasure to be here, Jimena. Pleasure to meet you too, Magdalena. We are here in Washington, D.C. in the unceded lands of the Piscataway. Um, and it's such such a pleasure to connect. Um, you reached out to us. You had um, seen something about Gestoras coming out and you reached out and it was a wonderful opportunity for us to connect. And I want to start out by the beginning, by your beginnings. How did you become involved with the arts? Is this something that was in you as a little girl that your family incentivized? Was it, where did that come from? Well, it's always so hard to kind of decide by when or, or, or as of when. Um, I'm from Chile, from Santiago, and I think I've always grown up with arts being part of day-to-day -day life. There's always been singing, there's always been a guitar, always. I can't remember any gathering in my family that somebody wouldn't bring out a guitar and everybody would start singing. Um, my mother's a painter, which helps. So I remember going to her studio. She started as a political scientist and then um, got married and then decided to, you know, really follow her passion, which, which was painting. So I grew up uh, observing that. But I would say music has been a really important part of my life, particularly. Um, and so, so, yeah, I've always been interested. I've always, as a very young girl, Seeing the power of arts and culture, I was born six months before the dictatorship happened in my country in Chile. Obviously, I don't remember that. Um, but I do remember being very young and seeing the power of music and the power of art to connect people. And it's always fascinated me. Yeah, I was born three years before uh, the golpe in Uruguay too. And 
very similar kind of experience of, of having music and art still be some way that people could connect to each other and express feelings about what was happening um, then and later on, absolutely. Sometimes when words are too difficult, the art can convey what words can't in a way. Yeah. And, and what was your training since you came from this very musical environment Did you and, and your mom was a painter? Did you train um, as an artist or what was your, where, where did your career take you? So um, I, I thought that I wanted to be an architect or I did want to be an architect growing up. I was always fascinated. I've always been interested uh, in sort of, well, actually I'm originally also a trained pianist, but I don't practice. I stopped that many, many years ago. Um, but music was always part of our family. Um, music journalism um, is what um, my family are very well known and probably a little bit of politics there. Um, so uh, I um, thought that I was going to go down the architecture path and I had a weekend job in Santiago um, where I was uh, an assistant, a very junior assistant in a print workshop, the Chilean print workshop that was led by a very famous Chilean uh, artist who has passed away, Nemesion Tunes. And, um, and that, well, uh, printmaking is very process driven. So it's patience, it's um, allowing accidents to happen in terms of the creation process, but in the experimentation process, it included chemistry. It was just a really interesting space to be in. It suddenly opened up this real interest for me to go and um, study uh, arts, visual arts. At the same time, my father was um, a diplomat, is a diplomat. So I had this interesting contrast between diplomacy, art, which kind of is the blending of the two is where I've landed really. But so my formal training was um, in uh, printmaking as a visual artist. Um, and then beyond that, I started to be interested in things beyond the actual presentation of it, but what sits behind it, who decides who is in galleries, museums, who are those decision makers, what do they look like? And then that kind of led me down different paths well, why does it look in a particular way? How can I change that? What's my role as a young woman? All those sorts of things um, started the level of inquiry. So now you're going to answer all of those questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many hours do we have? I said. <laughs> It's chapter one today. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. So my father um, was a uh, diplomat and um, he we traveled around the world um, ever since I was a little girl. Um, he had been uh, working already in um, the government and then obviously the military dictatorship happened and they were um, very short uh, staffed when it came to foreign affairs. So it was a good way to sort of um, not lose his job and he was always interested in um, also international relations. So we travelled. I lived in countries like Bolivia. I lived in Peru. I lived in the Philippines. I lived in Canberra, Australia. Um, my father had many other posts, um, but I was older. But what what took me to Melbourne, um, where I ended up doing my um, tertiary studies, was the fact that he was posted there. So it gave me the opportunity. And I think that also sparked a real interest in terms of you know, growing up in different environments, knowing that you came from elsewhere. What does this mean? How do you connect with people? Um, and I think I was very, I'm quite conscious of the privilege I had and at the same time, the responsibility to carry, you know, visiting somebody, somebody's home in terms of a, a different country, respecting the context, and at the same time learning. I was young, so I absorbed a lot of that. Um, so, so yeah. So then I and I, I didn't. I wasn't sure that I was going to migrate to Australia because I was really I was studying graphic design in Chile, which I at the same time as I was saying working at the Chilean Print Workshop, and I realized that 
I didn't want a commercial output. Uh, when I go back and say that I first wanted to study architect, um, I didn't have enough uh, uh, like um, scoring in my uh, um, high school uh, results to get into architecture, but I got into graphic design. And then I realized that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted a much more expressive space. I didn't want to be responding to a client. And so then the print making kind of opened up this possibility of, well, maybe an art practice is the way to go. Um, so then I came to Australia because my father was posted as Consul General at that time in Melbourne. And what was meant to be a very short period, I initially came with a small luggage, I ended up being here as happens to many people around the world that you never know where the road you know, takes you. And I ended up um, studying. My parents finished their post and were posted to Brazil afterwards. And I ended up um, falling in love. These things happen. And um, which is, which, you know, we're, we're now celebrating 27, 28 years of marriage. So very, very Ooh, long. So story. romantic. <laughs> and, and also a really interesting story on his part because he's, uh, he's first generation Australian, Greek Australian. So his parents, his mother came on a boat to Australia, his father flew but you know there were you know non-english speakers and and so it was a really you know interesting connection so no so you had to so you both had to go around the world to find each other that is that is some serious rom-com material there that's i know and we only married about nine months after we met oh and we were so... very very young <laughs> <laughs> but here you are right yeah. It, is it in Australia then that, that you had this, what you were talking about before, right, that you began to think about who gets to decide and how are these decisions made? Is, is that in Australia when you started to think yes. more seriously about that? Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, I love my country, Chile, but during the late or well, the early 90s, I was very dissatisfied. I, I, um, I hated many things about the society in my country. I, you know, and I mean, this is a very personal experience and it's sort of, um, it's not like that today, but it was incredibly conservative. It was incredibly chauvinistic, male chauvinistic. It was, um, yeah, there was just a lack of openness to what was happening around the world. And I guess I had experienced so many different contexts that I was getting really frustrated. I was feeling like I didn't belong. And so I needed to seek other spaces. And and I guess, you know, I was, again, in a very lucky situation of my parents being in Australia at that time because I stayed in Chile for university. And then I came to this society which was so open in contrast. Um, and, you know, it didn't matter who I was, what background I was. Um, I felt like anonymity in a way allowed me to set a new pace, a new definition. Um, so when I arrived in Australia and then I got into university, um, I started to realize that while societal, the society around me was very diverse, the arts wasn't that diverse. And even though there were a lot of women, that didn't necessarily mean that they would graduate or they would go on to have, you know, many leadership positions. So I found that I was a Latina who then did not have an Australian accent, had more of a foreign accent, um, who was very kind of a outspoken in a way because that's the environment that I had grown up in that you need to speak, even though my parents generally told me to be quiet because, you know, <laughs> That we were in, but you know, it was you speak up. There's an issue, you speak up, and you're open, and you put it on the table, and you debate it. Whereas I walked into a society that was, on the surface, very comfortable, sort of very amicable, um, but at the same time started to, like for example, I remember very concretely there was second year of university, and one of my lecturers, male, says to me oh, you know, you make artwork that is so much, I'm very, I'm a very short person, so you make artwork that is very large. 
Um, printmaking is generally smaller, but, you know, I would make installations and very large pieces. Um, and, you know, you have a foreign name and you're a woman, you know, you're perfect biennial material. I mean, this is in the early 90s. And I'm like, what? And so then I changed my name and I started to present my work with the pseudonym of a male, which I won't say what name, but a male name, a male Anglo-Saxon name, because I wanted to test the waters. I'm like, okay, well, is my work going to be seen different if it's done by, and it's not the name, but by John Smith? What does that look like? So I kind of, so that investigation, which was more about my work and my practice, then started to make me realize that I was getting a little bit of traction because I was getting the attention of other artists or fellow students and even some of the lectures going, okay. I started to push the boundaries a little bit of what the status quo was at that mm. point. And then I started, and then I, that interests me into art history and, and also museum studies and who, who represents, who makes the decisions. And, and then I started to realize as much as I like my practice and my work is in some collections, um, I felt like maybe that wasn't the best way to convey my creative message or my message. And that's when I started to look at, well, hang on, I'm really interested in what's happening in other contexts, in other countries. I want to explore the world. I want to um, challenge the boundaries of what is acceptable and kind of offer a look at other alternatives. Um, I was invited to set up the first gallery at the um, at the Victorian College of the Arts, um, which was in a way the kind of the conservatorium type of the University of Melbourne. And I had no formal experience. I'd never worked as an arts manager, but I knew what the challenges were, and I and I I accepted the role. Um, and I started to investigate different models and uh, kind of possibilities around the world. And that's what then sort of opened my eyes to, hang on, maybe there's maybe there's another path that isn't necessarily my practice. I often get asked, do you miss your practice? And I said, I miss making, but my creative energy is 100% present in everything that I do, policy decisions that I make, um, considerations when we're looking at the working conditions of artists and like it's part of my day to day. So no, I don't think I've lost that. Yeah, there's enormous scope for creativity and necessity of having creativity precisely to tackle those problems because you have to imagine worlds that don't exist yet and imagine ways to get them. So I, I hear you absolutely on that. So the, you were part of the National uh, Cultural Policy Task Force for Creative Australia. You were involved with Kultur, um, the, the peak organization uh, working in diversity in Australia. So that is what, what happened next after this initial training and this when you were moving away from this, your pure artistic practice towards arts management. Well, there was a really important moment that I received a very prestigious uh, award in Australia called the Keith and Elizabeth Murdoch Travelling Fellowship, which is a, an incredible, uh, um, Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, uh, who's passed away, is probably the, one of the most important philanthropists in Australia. And she would award a prize, um, a travelling prize for a project, a former alumni of the Victorian College of the Arts. And I won that um, award for my practice, which is just a, a, in parentheses, which the pra what I presented was a tribute to my grandfather who had passed away in Chile and I couldn't be there. So there was a, so it was about loss and kind of like memory and, 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 and also um, looking at generational knowledge and sort of passing of that. Anyway, so that's that's what got me the award. But then my project was to go and explore how non-Western art is represented in a Western context because I was particularly interested going back to those intersections. I started to get into museum studies and I, I enrolled to study museum studies and I won the award and I convinced UNESCO to allow me to do my internship then at 
ICOM, the International Council of Museums, because what I wanted to investigate is the ethics around it. I still saw it as a practice, as it was my creative practice and the result was going to be an exhibition. So it was a kind of a research and development to it. But what took me into a different path that I started to get interested in sacred object, human remains, repatriation, um, the concept of ethnographic museums, what does that mean, who is deciding, how are things labelled, even in terms of um, culture, cultural context. So that body of work then suddenly, and I, I spent a year in Paris, and I travelled around Europe looking at the different ethnographic museums, like in Denmark, I participated. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes see it as a little bit subversive because for me it was still about artistic investigation, um, but the context that I was in was really about more as, a, as an intern. I was very young. I was in my early 20s. Um, but that body of work then resulted to me coming back to Australia and realising as I said before, that the practice of it, the artistic practice wasn't the best avenue and that I wanted to pursue others. So when I when I came back, I started working in a project called the South Project, which was about South-South exchange um, across the world um, and looking at visual culture. And there was a lot of exchanges between particularly Indigenous and non-Indigenous arts and culture and, and in that space kind of self-determination about how we want to work together, trying to challenge again that little bit of the status quo in terms of the global north. And I um, was the director of that project for a few years, which took us to Chile, it took us to Brazil, to um, Indonesia, to South Africa, to New Zealand. Um, and from then, that then I went to Kultur and in my capacity, as CEO of that um, organization, was invited to be part of um, the National Task Force to write the new cultural policy for Australia. Um, yeah. I'm interested in that. What kind of things animated you when you were part of the task force uh, for this new cultural policy? What kinds of things did, were you bringing to the table? Well, um, I, I, I can't remember how many we were. We were about 20, I think, across Australia. And so, um, we all had a kind of a constituency to represent in a way, and so mine was cultural diversity, and particular the migrant experience. I mean, it was direct lived experience for me, um, but it was also of making sure that I was being truthful and honest to the diversity of what that means in Australia, because this country is a country, and please don't quote me on this exactly, but it's something like used to be anyway about 60 to 65 percent of the population has at least one parent that was born overseas that's 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 quite large um yeah yeah so it's it, in terms of even generational um there are and then if you look at um the diversity of languages the diversity of faiths um but i think what was really interesting for me is that you know, you had somebody looking at music, you had somebody looking at theatre. Cultural diversity was across. And, I mean, there were a couple of people that were focused on First Nations. Um, but in terms of the diversity, the demographic that I was responsible for just felt so disproportionately big in a way because I wanted to make sure that there was cultural diversity in theatre, in music, in 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 um, you know a whole range of different sort of in in the gallery sector in the performing arts spaces, so that sometimes felt a little bit like a very very big challenge. However, it was an incredibly collaborative space where, for me, it was always saying, okay, let's not stick to one aesthetic or one viewpoint or one canon because if we're truly going to it, um, talk about a straight. Because to me, the key thing was the kind of the white paper for the national cultural policy was then um, telling Australian stories. So I wanted to unpick what is an Australian story. And so we needed to look at our society, our demographic, that diversity. So if we went with a canon, with a more traditional sort of traditional, I mean kind of Western canon, then it was only, so I had to prove through metrics of, you know, what is the demographic, who we, who is represented. So. 
but it was a really like incredible space to be in um and i'm really grateful for the honor and it was led by who regrettably has passed away recently uh, the minister of culture or of the arts uh, simon crean at that time a member of parliament and it was a really it was a direct insight into how the challenges he had he had a multiple portfolio um of, of how he would make sure that that this would sort of occur. And I have to say there were many challenges along the way, a change of government. But today, what's really exciting in Australia is that uh, there is a new cultural policy that, that has been um, uh, announced and Creative Australia is going to be launched tomorrow. So oh things, my goodness. Yeah, so oh things, my things do take time and this is a good 10 more, 15 years um, yeah, and so that space gave me the opportunity to continue thinking about maybe a role I can have in the policy area. Sure, and that's an incredible achievement to come up with a cultural policy for a country with such an Im immense <laughs> amount of diversity or in scope of diversity as you were describing. And, and it seems that your approach bringing diversity to the table in the cultural policy was to not treat it as one more area you know, dance, theater, et cetera, I mean, diversity, but rather to have diversity infused throughout, um, that, it, that it has to be present throughout all of the disciplines and in all of the ways. Absolutely. And I would say that kind of going back to the role of culture now, not only on the cultural policy, but culture's agenda, when I took on the role of, well, t today that organization is called National, um, the, sorry, Diversity Arts Australia is what it's called today, and it's led by a really wonderful CEO, Lena Nalus. Um, but for me, when I took on the role of CEO at Kultur, it was really focused around the presentation of diverse um, artists, you know, or artists of diverse, here we sometimes use the word cold, culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, but I, I, I felt that was pigeonholing it again. It was like, okay, we will bring you this product that you can have and isn't it great? And I mean, of course, that's important, but, you know, what is your audience? Who are you not reaching? Who are members of the community that feel like they don't belong in your spaces, in your theatre? Let's let's reach out to them. Let's let's go to the Opera House, the Sydney Opera House, and let's have a conversation about what does your programming look like? So for me, it was that, that exact thing that you're saying about that kind of ensuring that it is across, and also across levels, there's some really great work that um, Diversity Arts Australia is doing now around um, a self audit of your institution, like your governance, how representative is it? Um, you know, the people you hire, the senior leadership team. Um, so all like layers and layers. So there's so many ways you can cut it to kind of go, okay, who is at the table? Who is, who is making decision? It's, it's not good enough to say, oh, yes, we employ a quota that, does, you know, what are their roles? What are the decision making? Um, delegations so i think for me it's that we assure change or positive change when we really change the structures and it, and then that more systemic change is achieved it's not just the representation in what we exhibit or what we program uh, without having diversity in the decision making structures it doesn't really change anything absolutely Absolutely. I I found really interesting, um, the last Sydney Biennale here was uh, curated by an incredible um, First Nations curator, Brooke Andrew. And Brooke Andrew is, you know, an internationally renowned visual artist that is, you know, um, of a calibre that is out of this world. Um, so he has an incredible breadth of knowledge and networks. So having somebody with that understanding and that perspective and vision and cosmology in terms of his own context, bringing that diversity into the, Venice, the Sydney Biennale was super interesting because you also got a very different type of artist collaborating, also a sense of, you know, who to collaborate, collaborate locally. So I think what for me is really important and I had this conversation with a colleague a long time ago that there was a time in which there was only two of us that were of non-Western background that were in leadership roles in Australia that weren't about 
directly diversity. Do you know what I mean? So, so, and in fact, the tides are changing, but not that long ago, Wesley Enoch, who's the, um, I believe then artistic director of the Sydney Festival, which is one of the most important festivals, was the only Indigenous leader in a, in a kind of a broader leadership role rather than in an Indigenous role. And when that starts to happen, when you get that level of kind of um, diversity, when you get, yeah, you know, then you really start to see change and you avoid those silos and pigeonholing. Exactly what you're saying here in the U.S. That is very that that has been very common too, right? That black or Latino uh, cultural managers are often in the position of being uh, equity and diversity officers, be in charge of diversity initiatives. But that's not the real change, and it also puts the burden of change on people who are already in a position of less power, right? It's so unfair as well. It's when you start to see people occupy decision-making positions that impact the entire organization or impact policy, that's when the real the real change happened. And it's, it, what you're saying, it seems like that's everywhere. <laughs> that's what's happening everywhere. So you were crafting, being part of this group, crafting Australia's new cultural policy, and then you were in Chile, crafting Chilean cultural policy. <laughs> well, one thing I would always say is be careful what you wish for. And, uh, and somebody always says to me, you just have to visualize it. Yeah, be careful what you visualize. <laughs> because obviously, you know, I mean, I, I felt so honored to work in the Australian context. Australia has been, um, I now have dual citizenship. It's been such an incredible country for me. And I, you know, I, I owe this country so much and I have so much love and respect for it. Uh, but it's something very different to work for your country of birth, the country that you culturally sort of you identify as a person. Um, so these things, sometimes it's it's um, things that happen that are unexpected and one just needs to be open to the possibility. Uh, the then Minister of Culture came to Australia for the can't remember what summit, the fifth world summit maybe on arts and culture that is led by IFICA, which now I run, which at the time obviously I didn't. I was uh, just an attendee. They asked me to they asked me to moderate one of the sessions. Anyway, um, and then the Minister of Culture of Chile came because Australia was handing over the baton because Chile was going to host the next one. And there was a meeting and I got invited to consider working, which was a really- You got, you got poached is what happened. You got poached. <laughs> <laughs> I got poached. I had, I had never worked professionally in Spanish. I mean, even though I'm a absolute, you know, it's my mother tongue. Um, it's like, okay. Um, and then, but I, I was so overwhelmed by emotion and humbled by the possibility and I spoke to my husband, my my Greek uh, Australian, who is a navigator in his DNA, and he said, "Let's do it." I mean, he didn't speak Spanish, and we relocated, and which was amazing because I was I lived for three years, and I had my parents because my parents are in Santiago, and I had my older sisters there, so it was just an amazing opportunity to reconnect. And um, and yeah, he said, "What role?" And I, and I said, if it's available, <laughs> I'd like to be your advisor on international affairs, a director of international affairs. And why was that? Why was it that international affairs uh, was what you wanted? Well, I mean, I felt like because I already had the context of another country and I had I also had done that research work at UNESCO and I continued to all the work that I did. I was always thinking about how to learn from other countries. Even when I was rethinking the role of culture and diversity, I thought, okay, I need to find out what's happening across the world. And I collaborated, we collaborate, collaborated a lot with, um, with the UK, particularly looking at their diversity and inclusion. I wanted to explore quotas, whether they work. We looked at a whole range of different countries, but I needed to make sure that they were kind of relatable to the Australian context. Um, 
So I felt like going back to when I wanted to leave the country because I felt it was so conservative, like, well, maybe this is a way in which I can influence because I can contextualise what is happening across the world and potentially bring in some fresh ideas. And I also felt that the international portfolio would allow me to be a little bit different and it was almost like I had to be different to what was happening in the national context. And also I hadn't worked in the national context, even though I had presented exhibitions, we had done projects with the ministry in the past, you know, under different ad administrations. Um, there had been that level of exchange, but I hadn't, I, I didn't feel well versed. I, two, two areas I would have gone down, either international relation or option two would have been to develop their cultural diversity area. Um, um, and so, but I felt that the international relations would also enable me to understand what was happening at a national level, you know, learn a lot and then be able to connect the dots in terms of what's happening internationally and hopefully support. So that was, um, yeah, it was a big mental shift language context. You know, I came, I was living in a very horizontal society in in, in, in terms of, men women roles you know uh in chile i walked into a significantly more conservative um still i mean progressive since i'd left but um it was a very different dynamics and i had to kind of remember certain codes but at the same time claim or redefine them and go hang on i have an opportunity to not go back into exactly which is what i did <laughs> And in these two very different contexts that you were talking about, were there things in common that you experienced in terms of people being willing or unwilling to embrace change? Change is always very difficult, right? But yeah, we're all yeah. Humans, and there's certain things that 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 people find um, easier to navigate, and certain things that they're particularly more afraid. What did you encounter in in both of those places? Look, I I find I would say that throughout my my professional trajectory and even my life, I think, I find that the the adversity around change is more about a lack of voice or not being heard. I find that if you create an environment that really talks about that kind of dialogue and the true definition of dialogue is that what you say is as equally important as what I'm saying and we're trying to find common ground, I think then the ability to go into that change space is a lot easier. But if people feel like they're invisible or they're not being heard, or um, then that's a really tricky one. Um, also, um, organizational or institutional knowledge is so important. And that if somebody comes in fresh, and I mean, it's taken me a long time to accept that I'm that I'm naturally in my DNA a change agent. It's 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 what I thrive in. But not everybody is comfortable with that, and not everybody needs not everything needs to change. So it's also about honouring what has happened and the lessons learned, and not reinventing the wheel. And I guess that's part of the work that I do today is like supporting a member institutions to say, "Hang on, another country's done this. Let's have a conversation around that," rather than feeling like, which happens often across the world, change of government change agreement let's start from zero it's like well hang on there is organizational knowledge that can be really important so i think it's um not everybody's comfortable with the change but it's also yeah being that in that sort of listening space of um there's the 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 belkin um personality profiling that i once did a leadership course and i came out as being red which is like leadership, like very charging, but coordinator, which is very unusual because the coordinator is generally the one that is at the back making sure that everybody's moving forward. So to me, leadership has to be about sometimes leading from behind and making sure that people that are not comfortable with change are part of that sort of journey. So, and I'd say that that's a human thing. It's less cultural, obviously you've got to navigate the cultural nuances of the context, but I think it's a universal thing that, you know, people want to be heard and, and people have the right to be heard because they've been doing work and valuable work. So I think 
Um, and then taking them through the journey, I found that um, in Chile there was very kind of set processes of how you do things. So, you know, with the team that I had, which was an incredible team, was like, well, let's test the waters. And they were like, oh, I don't know whether we can. I'm like, we're the international division. You know, we can look elsewhere and say, look, these are the models that are happening. So we would push boundaries and go, well, let's, we set up um, this uh, intergovernmental committee. You know, we had foreign affairs there. We had tourism, we had trade and, and but we were leading and they're like, well, hang on. No, 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 culture's going to lead. And we were confident, but, you know, we brought them along and uh, we ensured that the language was relevant for them and that they had input. So, so coming at arts and culture policy from an international affairs perspective lets you not only harvest ideas and models from other places, but it also allowed you the sort of interagency uh, connections that you could have precisely Absolutely. because you were in international affairs. And, and you've written about that. You've written about that in the latest report for UNESCO. You wrote about how yeah. one of the difficulties that we have in advancing cultural policy has to do with that interagency collaboration, although we've expanded the participation of civil society. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I, I think that... Um... I mean, we don't live in silos and we don't, you know, think of music or listen to music and then, you know, participate in a community activity or like our life isn't siloed in that way. We don't think about, OK, today it's about the economy of my life and then tomorrow it's about the social aspects and the well-being and you know what I mean? And, you know, on Friday I'll think about health. It doesn't work like that, you know. It's all intertwined. So for me it's... That's how we need to think about culture, the cultural portfolio, and that's how we need to think about those that don't work in the arts and culture area to see that, hang on, you are part of it. You are a stakeholder. You are a, you are a participant. You are a consumer. You're possibly a decision maker that impacts. So it's having those conversations are really critical. And in the work that we do at IFICA and also what I analyze in terms of the global report is that there's a real challenge in kind of making the case for a larger culture budget. And so, but there are budgets in other portfolios that could easily be delivered through cultural outcomes. And so if we have a conversation, in actual fact, you could end up making, um, you know, somebody in the social development space or somebody in health, making their life a little bit easier um, by saying, hang on, you need, some of the outputs that you have to deliver against are X, Y, Z. We can help you do that. And we just need a little bit of investment to go towards. So suddenly, rather than having to just fight for the culture budget in your portfolio, you actually have a whole entourage of allies that are going, yeah, yeah, I need this to work because this is going to help me deliver on X, Y, Z. And that's what that whole of government approach is uh, really important. And for me... I found when I was working in Chile, um, I found it really interesting that the culture portfolio, even though it depended on education, we reported to the social development portfolio. And I always remember that when we had to prepare the kind of the budget papers um, for the minister to review and present, we had to answer a very simple question. What problem are you trying to resolve? And it's, you know, and so you need to be really accurate. It's public spending. You need to make sure that you're clear in terms of who it's going to reach. So when you're thinking about how does this sit within a social development context, what bigger problem it can't, it actually makes you think differently. When you bring people from other portfolios, other uh, policy areas, um, you, it actually it, it, it encourages you, if not forces you, to think differently how you communicate to those that aren't in the cultural sector that we sometimes are guilty of speaking in a certain code that is difficult or not easily translatable or decodified in terms of different portfolios. Yeah, and speaking to ourselves, right? Speaking amongst Absolutely. ourselves in the sort of echo chamber of ourselves. Well, That's and right. now in the position you occupy now, you're doing that in an exponential kind of way, right? Not the, not the speaking in codes or in echo chambers, but this kind of cross disciplinary, cross agency, cross everything on a global scale. So, um, so you were in Australia doing cultural policy, in Chile doing cultural policy. Now you're back in Australia doing really international cultural policy. 
what do you think are the skills um, or what are the skills, the arts management skills or personal characteristics that help you do the job that you do? Um, look, um, believe in yourself, I think is a really important, um, we sometimes, or I sometimes feel like um, a little bit of imposter syndrome when you think about, am I the right person to be saying this? And then you go, hang on, actually, I've done the work, I've done the field work. I have to admit, I don't have the, the academic credentials. I wish I had. I just haven't had the time to it. It's been a you know busy decade. It's been a little busy. A little busy. <laughs> but to me, the lived experience and the working on the ground and the learning on the ground has meant that I I have the perspective of what it is looking at it from the government perspective. I have the perspective from civil society. I have the practitioner. I have the the audience perspective. So it's kind of constantly making sure that your multiple hats, you're kind of analysing what it is that you're confronted with and also assuming that we all have knowledge but we also have baggage. And so, you know, kind of trying to divide what is um, what is right or what I, what I think needs to push forward and then what is my makeup of who I am that may not necessarily... And working in the international space is always a really... It has to be a lot of self-reflection because what I assume is the path may not necessarily be the path for you, may not necessarily be the path for, you know, a minister that I'm speaking to in a Southeast Asian country or it might not be the cultural policy situation in the Gulf region. So it's kind of going, okay, so this is my context. And so that listening aspect is really, really, really critical the other is um, evidence base. I cannot emphasize enough. I mean, um, it takes time, but making sure that the arguments that you're making are really strongly based on evidence examples. So while in a way my role is generalist, I make sure that if I'm going to go to specifics, then I know um, that I have that backup. Um, surround yourself with intelligent people, very important. Um, you know, I'm surrounded by incredibly intelligent people, um, probably much more intelligent than I am, but that together we bring these ideas and test the waters. Um, so what if it goes today is thanks to a very large group of people working both in the secretariat, the board, um, and our members. Um, so it's that sort of constant, it's, it's a kind of balance between being confident and bold and 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 um, believing in what you uh, believe is required um, and at the same time having the humility and reflection to go I, I may not necessarily have all the answers and in fact I could be wrong and that that's okay as long as there's an investigation to what that means and how we can resolve that moving forward but um but I think those qualities, and empathy and listening are absolutely critical. And I'm grateful for my upbringing. I'm grateful for being a Latina. I love being a Latina. I love being a woman. I wouldn't change any of those things because I think they kind of challenge and, you know, give me a certain richness in terms of how I may present ideas or look at things in different perspectives, through different lens. You talked earlier about the difficulties in in, in having a sing, the, the impossibility of having a single truth, right? That what may be true for you might, or the view the way forward that you see for you might not be the way an East Asian country sees it, and might not be the way a European country sees it. Um, so, to balancing all those competing ideas and competing interests, that takes a lot of energy, right, and a lot of mental gymnastics to to manage. What are, what excites you most about the work that you do, and where do you get your strength from or your energy for, to do to do this work? Um, well, I, for one, I, I feel like it's really purposeful. And one of the first challenges that I was given when I took on the role of executive at IFICA was to do an internal review whether we were fit for purpose. And I said to the board very openly, I said, you, do you really want me to do this? Yes. And I said, do you realize that if we do this, honestly, I could end up firing myself because the organization could potentially be redundant. And so I needed to be comfortable to do that and the board needed to give me the green light to do it. Um, 
and we did it and the organization still exists i'm pleased to say um but it was an interesting process to go okay really kind of unpick what that means in terms of our being really uh fit for purpose so for me that was sort of really uh critical to do that um and then once we had that sort of kind of really strong self-reflection um that purpose was kind of was really exciting about okay then what how can we support our members how can we we really kind of put it back on to what are the challenges our members had it was a lot of listening it was a lot of kind of um analyzing and um and i think that was sort of really critical so the more knowledge we had and the more understanding of the diverse challenges the more we were able to connect the dots in very different contexts and i think that was really important what fills me with pride and what drives me is the fact that i see change even though it's small i you know i mean in in many cases i can't say because you know for example it may seem a little bit abstract but after the ninth world summit that we just held had had in stockholm which was around um artistic freedom uh we wanted to i mean i, I will talk about the theme a little bit but i just want to say that one of the uh, somebody in a government role and i won't say where said to me i didn't realize i was a gatekeeper and that like and that just i mean that's what you want you want and not only in government we had you know members from civil society say i didn't realize that i was reinforcing stereotypes i didn't so what oh it's huge so for us the summit in stockholm which was really a key moment to say um to unpick artistic freedom and i would encourage people to see the report which is in english and spanish um on our website um which kind of looked at all of the sort of issues around um what it is to be able to uh create present distribute your work and participate in cultural life what does that look like um and who i who is deciding what i can access who is deciding what i can create who are um those gatekeepers in a way and kind of reflecting on internally how the fact that we're all part of in a way influencing um this space when we started the summit i said to the 400 and so delegates in the room i said we're here we were 91 countries were represented civil society academia policy the whole i provoked them by saying um we're here we all have um uh we're in a privileged position and we have a level of influence let's take that as a collective responsibility throughout the summit and let's see what we take back with us to our own context so it's that opportunity to bring people together to rethink existing models of what we understand as absolute and kind of challenge that sort of thinking in this case around artistic freedom you know we had first nations voices looking at how you know whether they were feeling represented or underrepresented you know what we were talking before what does that look like who is making those decisions we had the artistic community kind of critiquing also whether they were guilty of those things we looked at funding criteria we looked at countries that were in you know in war we looked at the displacement of those we looked at what happens when displacements creates another level of displacement in terms of alienation in the country that you're being received into we looked at racism and social injustices within country and the layers of society so you start to unpick this a lot larger and then you realize hang on this is everybody's problem this isn't the problem of a few artists that feel like they don't have an opportunity to speak and i guess that's what excites me the opportunities of putting those sorts of ideas and kind of having uncomfortable conversations that we really need to have but also having those moments of realization right to have those people say i didn't really realize i was a gatekeeper i didn't realize i was perpetuating this ah oh, that's that's 
that's your outcome right there, right? Of why it's so so important to get people together and learn about Absolutely. each other. Yeah. Absolutely. And 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 also that there are settings where in the summit we have a format where the mornings are recorded and they're live streamed, but the afternoons are not. And it's and it's exact precisely so to recognize that you know being uncomfortable also requires you you know you have to be a little bit vulnerable. And in that case, nobody wants to named and shamed we want to have the conversations and in order for us to have the conversations we need to create this safe space of these quiet spaces yeah so um we're nearing the end of our time and i wanted to ask you we we ask all of our hitoras to leave a question for someone else um and the question i'm going to ask you comes from alicia olivares robles and i think you started to answer it a little bit her question is what what I, of your identities, the, the identities that you own, how do they inform and how do they help you do your work successfully? Um, oh, every aspect of who I am informs my work. Um, and uh, my multiple identities are kind of, depending on the setting, is when one kind of shines a bit more than uh, the other. And I guess it's that being res that responsive nature of the environment I'm in. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, I mean, I'm very proud of who I am as a whole, but, you know, and there are many layers of that um, people don't know uh, of, of me, but still sort of inform my work or inform how I formulate ideas. Not everybody knows that I had a practice. Um, you know, no, not many people in my work know that I have a child with a disability, you know, little things that kind of make up who I am. But all of those things inform me and influence my decision making. And I always try and think of, you know, how does this resonate in terms of who I am as an individual? And you know, somebody once told me that, you know, uh, your worst enemy, you are your worst enemy if you undermine who you are. So it's really kind of, and, and that one of my mentors said that, and it's just really kind of to have that conviction of um, be proud of who you are and, but, but at, at the same time, protect who you are so you allow that vulnerability to come out when you see and think it's appropriate and and when it's going to, you know, better deliver um, what you need, better communicate, and at the same time protect you if you're in an environment where that vulnerability needs to be yours to own and not to be shared. So I think, and look, I don't know if it's a, if it's a gender thing, but I find women and, you know, women, people that identify in the kind of broader, you know, women, female space tend to have that constant needing to kind of negotiate those different spaces and, you know, kind of decide when to push and, and not. And there are certain settings. I mean, I've had plenty of situations where I've been undermined for being a woman. I've been, you know, questioned how I can work full time, having three children and traveling and all the things. And, and, and you kind of, okay, well, that's, that that's your thing that you need to resolve it's not me and it's how much one is willing to share and is really entirely up to uh, one but i think that kind of pride and ownership of the diversity of what makes us makes us up as individuals i think is the best and the strongest position to be in because nobody can you and i think that's what when i think about points of difference and negotiating, you know, even when I was working in Chile and looking at multilateral or bilateral agreements that were about negotiating, you know, aspects, it was all about, okay, what do I know? Where do I come from? How do I position that? How do I create those arguments? And obviously, as I said before, backed up with evidence base. And what about little Magdalena? So if you had to, if you were to encounter yourself as a young person, maybe not little Magdalena, but as a very young person, just starting out, um, maybe she is printmaking, doing her printmaking right now and starting to have these questions. What would you say to her if you came across her today? Um, follow your gut instinct because you're generally right. If there's some, if there's an opportunity, jump at it. Um, be comfortable with falling. 
I think it's taken me a long time to be okay. At first I thought failure was, or falling was failure and that was it. But I would say that every time an opportunity has come, there's also been a moment of things not going right and kind of having to pick myself up and kind of learning from that. And um, I think one of the most important moments in my life have been moments of disruption where I thought things were going to fall apart. And it just made, it's, I, I see those as opportunities to rethink. And it sort of relates to when COVID came, there was a really important moment where Ifika could have, could have folded and kind of not been able to keep up or it, it kind of s s sort of um, we flipped into a very different mode because it was that disruption went, okay, we need to get up and make a difference at a time when we knew we were needed because we had the knowledge of what was happening around the world in real time. So I think that for me is, um, yeah, so believe in yourself. Um, it's okay to get it wrong. You definitely don't have all the answers. Definitely not. Um, and find some people in your life that, um, you know, resonate and you trust and you believe and admire and ask, them, ask for advice. And those people that you don't need in your life, it's okay to edit them. That's excellent advice. I hope she listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> she was a bit stubborn a lot. <laughs> so Magdalena, what question would you like to leave for another one of your colleagues here on Gestoras to answer? Oh dear. Well, quite quite often when I'm moderating a session and I've got, you know, a few people or two people, I want them to walk in the shoes of the other and then ask ask them uh, a question or provide them with advice. So so maybe, I mean, this is a little bit different, but say if you were to be in a, in a meeting or in a room where you had to speak or collaborate with somebody who was the antithesis of what you believe in and represent, how would you get them to the table? How would you create that common ground? All right, I will ask that question. Okay. <laughs> Magdalena, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you oh, very much for making all this time you. to share all of this with us. Thank you. No, pleasure. Pleasure. This was Gestoras. This episode of Gestoras was hosted by me, Jimena Varela, and produced by Anush Titanian. It was recorded in Washington, D.C. and Melbourne, Australia. Our theme song is Hace que exista. Make It Exist by Eli Almik. The graphic design is by Bia Silva. Gestoras is mixed and supported in part by the Arts Management Program at American University, Washington, D.C. For 50 years, the Arts Management Program at American University has been training leaders in the arts to change the world for the better. Find out more at artsmanagement.american.edu. Follow us on YouTube at Gestoras and on Facebook and Instagram at Gestoras Podcast. Thank you for listening and don't forget to like and subscribe.